Hello, Booktube, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. Uh, these are the books I've been working on this week. So, I've finished up Getting Things Done by David Allen, and I reviewed it earlier this week, and I'll leave a link in the description down below to my review of this in case you missed it. But I am now done with this book. So uh, that was a book I was reading for professional development. And the idea was when I finished that, I would be done with my professional development reading for this year. Except I picked up how to teach for exams because of a project, a research project I'm working on. Uh, so uh, I, now the, at this point, I, I'm past the point where it's re useful for my research. So I'm now reading this on my own time instead of reading this uh, for work. But uh, I'm over halfway through, so I'm, I'm going to keep on going with this. Uh, it, it's useful information. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit dry as, as these books are. This is how to teach for exams. Um, but, but good, solid, useful information in here. So, um, yeah, I, the plan was to be done with professional development reading, but I've just got this lingering over. Uh, I do feel like, uh, I mentioned this in, in a previous video this week, but I, I do feel like the first half of this year has mainly been slogging through Journey Through the West uh, and then various linguistics or uh, professional development reading. Uh, and... I want, for my reading goals for the second half of the year, to just knock off a bunch of easy, short books and, and uh, increase my reading number that way. I mean, I, I, I know it's not about the number of books, right? If, if you read a couple big, heavy classics, then maybe that's just as well or better than, than a number of small books. But I, I just want... I just, I just want, want to be able to talk about more books, I guess. Uh, f get that feeling of accomplishment by checking stuff off my list. So, uh, I've decided anyways, uh, Journey to the West, um, although it, it does have its pleasures, is just really long. It just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, but I've... I've been realizing recently that the point of a book like this is not to read through it as quickly as possible. The, the reason it goes on and on and on like it does is because it's, it's, it's like the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales. It's, it's like a compendium of folk tales. Uh, now, now this, these folk tales all have the same characters in them, right? They, they all have the monkey, the pig, and the, the monk, and Friar Sand, and... It, 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 but the the their stories are episodic, and it, it's it's meant to be. Each episode is meant to be its own story, and I think, you know, th this this wasn't meant to be a book where you're like, oh, I've got to get through this as quickly as possible so I can check this off my reading list and get on to the next one. Uh, it, it's, it's it was a, something that was meant to be up on the shelves. And you would take it down every night and read a story with your family aloud. You know, back in the old days when people read books aloud in the evening to each other. Uh, and it was it was just meant to be like a, a treasury of all these all these stories uh, about all the adventures they uh, encountered on their journey to the West. And it wasn't meant to be read like straight through like a novel. Uh, especially like trying to read through it as quickly as possible. It, it was meant to be read slowly and savored. So, for the rest of the year, I'm, I'm going to make it a point to try and read a couple pages of this every day, but it's on the back burner. Uh, I'm going to try and... Uh, and uh, this one's on the back burner as well, because I, I feel like I've already done my professional development reading for this year. I'll slowly chip away at this one as well, a couple pages each, each day. But uh, these two are on the back burner, and I'm going to try and move in a bunch of smaller, shorter reads uh, for the for the rest of the year. That's my reading goals from now until the year is out. 
So, uh, first one up is Harriet the Spy, which I uh, found at a used bookstore uh, about a year ago and has been sitting on my shelves since then. It's missing a few pages at the end, but not to worry. These few pages are the uh, sneak peek of Harriet Spies again, so they're not part of the main text. Um, the, the book is kind of falling apart a bit, as you can see. I'm not sure if that's because it's a used book or if it because the publisher was a bit cheap. Um, I mean, if, if you open it up, you can kind of see, yeah, it, it, it is falling apart, but it, it'll, it'll hold up to one reading. So uh, I mentioned in my started video that there are sections of this book which feel familiar. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if I read it as a kid or not. Uh, there are definitely sections of it I read, but I think those may have just been excerpts that were included in like other books, you know, like a, a tr you know, um, an anthology of children's literature or something like that where they would just have a, a chapter. Um, one thing that I do remember from childhood is a scene of a girl sitting in a cafe, eavesdropping in on conversations and trying to picture who's saying the conversation uh, and then checking her answers. And for whatever reason, that stuck in my head over the years. Um, and I thought that that was probably from Harriet the Spy but I wasn't entirely sure. But uh, sure enough, that, that passage was in uh, the, the reading I did for this week. So, uh, you know, because this is a children's book and because it's got big print and nice and easy to read, I've been making good progress on this. I'm, I'm 164 pages into it already. We'll, with any luck, finish it off within the next couple days and, and then come back with a full review of it. So uh, maybe I'll save most of my thoughts for the full review, but uh, I am finding, I'm finding the, this, the, the, the dialogue and characterization in this book to be quite funny at times. Uh, the author's got a real ear for humor. So yeah, uh, what, what's, what's a good part for this? Um, yeah, they're, they're Harriet and her friends, uh, her classmates, are getting in the school pageant. And uh, the, the classmates have voted over Harriet's objections to uh, do a Christmas dinner for their, uh, for their dance at the Christmas pageant. And so they're all going to represent different foods at the Christmas dinner. Uh, and they're, they're going to the theater director to get... Uh, fitted for costumes and the theater director is kind of a, an eccentric lady and she she says lovely lovely now let's see vegetables first vegetables sport started to sprint for the door sports uh, one of the boys Harriet's friends Miss Ellison pulled him back by the ear Pinky Whitehead arrived back he had gone to the bathroom Miss Berry turned to him and chanted you will make a wonderful stalk of celery. What? Pink, said Pinky stupidly. And you, she pointed to Harriet, are an onion. This was too much. I refuse. I absolutely refuse to be an onion. She stood her ground. She could hear Sport whispering his support behind her. Her ears began to burn as they all turned and looked at her. It was the first time she had ever really refused to do anything. Oh dear, Miss Berry looked as though she might run out the door. Harriet, that's ridiculous. An onion is a beautiful thing. Have you ever really looked at an onion? Miss Elson was losing all touch with reality. I will not do it. Harriet, that's enough. We won't have any more of this impudence. You are an onion. I am not. Harriet, that is quite enough. I won't do it. I quit. Sport was pulling at her sleeve. He whispered frantically, You can't quit. This is a school. But it was too late. A roar of laughter went up from the group. Even that mild thing, Beth Allen, was laughing her head off. 
Harriet felt her face turning red. Um, and there, there's another passage which is a little bit similar when Harriet finds out her parents have, are planning to sign her up for dance classes. Um, where was it? Yeah. So uh, this is from chapter five. It's earlier. It's, this, this is quite similar in character, but this also had me chuckling to myself. Uh, that night at dinner, everything was going along as usual. That is, Mr. Welsh, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Welsh, that's Harriet's parents, were having an interminable rambling conversation about nothing in particular. Well, Harriet watched it all like a tennis match, when suddenly Harriet leaped to her feet as though she had just then remembered and screamed, I'll be damned if I'll go to dancing school. Harriet! Miss Welsh was appalled. How dare you use words like that at the table? Or any other place, dear, interjected Mr. Welsh calmly. All right, I'll be finked if I go to dancing school. Uh, she, Harriet's father uh, was complaining in, the, in a previous chapter about the uh, people he works with, and he was calling them rotten finks. So that's where Harriet has gotten the word from. I'll be finked if I go to dancing school. Harriet stood and screamed this solidly. She was throwing a fit. She only threw fits as a last resort, so that even as she did it, she had a tiny feeling in the back of her brain that she had already lost. She wouldn't, however, have it said that she went down without a try. Where in the world did you learn a word like that? Mrs. Welsh's eyebrows were raised almost to her hairline. It's not a verb, anyway, said Mr. Welsh. They both sat looking at Harriet as though she were a curiosity put on television to entertain them. I will not, I will not, I will not, shouted Harriet at the top of her lungs. She wasn't getting the right reaction. Something was wrong. Oh, but you will, said Mrs. Welsh calmly. It really isn't so bad. You don't even know what it's like. I hated it, said Mr. Welsh, and went back to his dinner. I do so know what it's like. Harriet was getting tired of standing up and screaming. She wished she couldn't sit down, but it wouldn't have done. It would have looked like giving up. I went there once on a visit with Beth Ellen, because she had to go and I was spending the night. And you have to wear party dresses, and all the boys are too short, and you feel like a hippopotamus. She said this all in one breath and screamed, Hippopotamus! Mr. Welsh laughed. An accurate description, you must admit. Darling, the boys get taller as you go along. I just won't. Somehow, indefinably, Harriet felt she was losing ground all the time. It isn't so bad. Mrs. Welsh went back to her dinner. This was too much. The point wasn't coming across at all. They had to be roused out of their complacency. Harriet took a deep breath and in as loud a voice as she could repeated, I'll be damned if I go. All right, that does it. Mrs. Welsh stood up. She was furious. You're getting your mouth washed out with soap, young lady. Miss Scully, Miss Scully, step in here a moment. There was no response. Miss Welsh rang a little silver bell and in a moment Cook appeared. Harriet stood petrified. Soap. Cook, will you tell Miss Scully to step in here a moment? Uh, Mrs. Welsh stood looking at Harriet as though she wore a worm uh, as Cook departed. Now, Harriet, to your room. Miss Scully will be up shortly. But your room, said Mrs. Welsh firmly, uh, etc. The, the, the scene goes on, but, but you get the point. Um, so, so some very funny stuff in here. On the other hand, there are some passages which makes me think that the author is a little bit too enamored of her own cleverness. Um, and Harriet herself is shown to be a little bit too precocious at times. But I'm holding off judgment until I kind of see where this is all going. And if Harriet's perceptions of the world world turn out to be validated at the end or, or what, what we're doing here. Uh, but but in, in enjoying it. it, it's a very quick, easy read, and uh, well, it's, it's a classic, isn't it? A classic of children's literature. Um, 
Journey to the West, I, I know I just got done saying this was on the back burner, but I made good progress on this this week. Uh, from uh, page uh, 1,520 to 1,660. So 140 pages, that, that's good for me in a week. Um, I, yeah, I know I said this was going on the back burner, but I, I had some time uh, at work this week where this was with me, and so I was able to just get some reading done on this. So, uh, yeah, there was actually a few different adventures they went through. Uh, they went, I'll, I'll try and recount them briefly because, uh, I, I just don't have, I just don't have it in me to do a detailed recounting this week, although, although I know I've done in, in past weeks. They, they went to a village where, uh, it was covered in, um, rotted parsimons and also being, uh, terrorized by an evil demon who took the form of a snake. Monkey and Pig fought the evil demon and killed him. Uh, and then Pig uh, was uh, dug through the rotting parsimons with his, his gigantic nose to clear the path. Uh, then they go to uh, a Purpurea kingdom um, where there's a king who's very sick. Uh, Monkey says that he can cure him. Everybody else is, um, the, you know, the monk is very shocked at this. Said, uh, you stupid monkey, you'll be the death of me. Yeah, you don't know anything about medicine. Uh, and sure enough, it I, has not been established in this book that Monkey knows anything about medicine. He has all these other powers because of his Taoist training or his Buddhist training. Um, but he, he is not able to... Uh, it, it, nowhere does it says that he knows, sorry, nowhere has it been established that he, he knows anything about medicine. Um, and I'm not quite exactly sure what's going on here. Part of me thinks this is another fault with this book, which has been true all along, which is Monkey has all these powers which you never hear about before, but which just come up as the story needs them. Uh, but then the other thing is, it. it Part of this seems like Monkey is just tricking everyone into thinking he knows about medicine. It's a little bit unclear. Monkey seems to be able to accurately diagnose the king's illness. Um, but then when he's prescribing medicine, Monkey fools everybody by just getting uh, some horse piss. Uh, the, now, the, the, the trick is the horse that they are traveling with is really a dragon disguised as a horse. So it's really dragon piss, and, and dragon piss apparently has all sorts of miraculous qualities. Um, it's, it's not the first time in this book that there's been a bit of bathroom humor. Um, probably won't be the last. Um, also, it's, uh, I think this is the first acknowledgement in, I don't know, in volume three at least, I don't think we've had an acknowledgement since volume two that the horse was really a dragon transformed. I, I thought that the book had completely forgotten about that. I, I assumed that the uh, author had forgotten that the horse was really a dragon and it was just back to being an ordinary horse now. It's been so long since it's been mentioned that he was really a dragon, but we it's not completely forgotten about. It, it came up again here. Uh, and then uh, once a king is cured from his sickness, uh, the king tells him about his worries. It seems like an evil demon stole his wife three years ago. Uh, Monkey goes and fights the evil demon, tries to rescue his wife. The evil demon has these magic bells which can uh, bring up fire and wind and, and uh, a sandstorm. Uh, Monkey's able to steal the magic bells, but then uh, before killing the evil demon, it turns out that the Bodhisattva, Guanyin, comes down, and this is actually her dog that's escaped and, and went and become an evil demon. Bodhisattva also reveals that the reason that the queen had been captured for three years is because the king had been punished. For uh, while he was hunting, he had killed a couple birds, which are apparently were like a reincarnation of the Buddha's mother's children. Uh, so to to 
make him suffer for that. That's that's why his wife had to be su- separated from him for three years, and that was the role that the evil demon was um, fulfilling. Now, uh, all of this was a pleasant enough read uh, as I was going through it, but um, a criticism which is frequently made of this book is that it's repetitive, and all of these story elements have popped up before. So uh, the evil demon being a pet of Bodhisattva, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the Bodhisattva that's escaped, uh, that's popped up a few times before. Uh, the evil demon actually dealing out karmic justice from heaven has popped up before. E- the evil demon having these magical uh, tools, which are actually stolen from the Bodhisattva, which monkey has to uh, fight against or steal, has come up before. Uh, it's uh, M- Monkey kills one of the evil demon's messengers and then dis- disguises himself as a messenger. That's come up before. So it, it's, it's I'm, I'm not sure they've all come up before in the same order in the same story before. So it's not an exact repeat of any chapter that we've had before. But all, all these story elements are repeated from previous stories. So, uh, yeah. And uh, again, I, I think this is w- what I said earlier in the video. Uh, you know, this is meant to be read uh, as a collection of stories rather than a novel that you just plow through as fast as you can. So if you view it as a collection of stories and the fact that some story elements are being repeated uh, is not like a um, that big of a deal maybe, or I don't know, a, l- a little bit annoying. But um, yeah, it, it, I, I think, again, this book is meant to just kind of sit on the shelf and then come down once a week after dinner for story time or something like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're, you're not supposed to try and plow your way through all these stories as quickly as possible. They're supposed to be savored. Uh, then uh, I'm right in the middle of chapter 71 now, where, uh, or no, I, I think chapter 70. Yeah, 72. Two, uh, where uh, they're uh, going along in the mountain, uh, they go to beg for food, and it turns out to be these beautiful girls who are really she demons, uh, and who capture the monk, and then monkey and pig have to rescue him, and him rescue the monk. And I'm still in the middle of that episode here, so uh, I'll just save that, talk about that next week, and, and see what happens as I read that. Uh, and then uh, the comic book. Um, so I read this week from page 674 to page, what is it, 740. So uh, not, not quite as much progress as last week. Um, a little bit less than 100 pages, actually. Still, still reading through the stories about Lilith, Dracula's daughter. Um, who, much like Satana, Satan's daughter, she's becoming more and more sympathetic uh, as these stories go on. So, uh, in, in, the, in the beginning stories, uh, she was, uh, seemed to be a villain. Uh, now she, then she was uh, a villain who could occasionally act, um, act on the side of good. Now she seems to be mostly acting for good. The, the art on her has also changed. I guess that's normal uh, in comic books, right? Um, the art has changed. And I'm in that now the, the, I think the last story in her arc, which is um, crossover with the X-Men. So yeah, still with the Dracula's Daughter storyline, but um, yeah. Yeah, I haven't had as much time to read the comic book this week, but but still enjoying it. Uh, and yeah, that's that's it. That, that's me done for this week. So uh, thank you very much, and I will see you again next week.